Oh, thank you, music team. I love that song. <clears throat> it reminded me of something that I, uh, that kind of an epiphany that I had. And um, <clears throat> I've, I'm often pretty judgmental about my weight, uh, you know, self judgment about my weight. And um, <clears throat> so uh, I was in, so I, most of you know I'm Jewish. And Jew, during the Jewish high holidays, I was reading the prayer book. And it talked about purpose, our purpose on this planet is love. Purpose is giving and receiving, circulating love. And I thought, <clears throat> well, if that's my purpose, it doesn't matter what package I'm in. That was, that was quite a, an epiphany for me. <clears throat> so <clears throat> my talk is take nothing personally, right? Sounds easy. <laughs> I have some bad news and some good news. The, bad, the good news is nothing, not one single thing anybody else says or does is about you. Here's the bad news. <clears throat> nothing that you say or do is about anybody else but you. <laughs> And so that places the challenge, I was going to say burden, but I changed my mind. The challenge of that is the, um, uh, the task we have of looking deep inside ourselves, find out what's going on when we have interactions with other people that we might find unpleasant. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is the Four Agreements. Most of you are probably familiar with this book um, by Michael Ruiz. And the, the third agreement is uh, don't take anything personally. <clears throat> and I just want to read a little bit out of that chapter. And to be perfectly frank, in my opinion, this chapter doesn't really delve enough into what it really takes not to take something personally, right? If, if, if I'm insulted by someone or criticized by someone, it's not enough to just say, well, I'm just not going to take that personally because it's just not about me. I mean, it's not enough. We have to dig deep if we react to that, right? If, we're, if our, we get our feelings hurt or if we get scared, um, it's, it's not enough to just say, well, that's about them and their opinion. We have to dig deep and find out what is being triggered in, in me. But I'm going to read this couple paragraphs anyway. Nothing other people do is because of you. It is because of themselves. All people live in their own dream, in their own mind. They are in com a completely different world from the one we live in. When we take something personally, we make the assumption that they know what is in our world, and we try to impose our world on their world. Even when the situation seems so personal, even if others insult you directly, it has nothing to do with you. What they say, what they do, and the opinions they give are according to the agreements they have in their own minds. Their point of view and our point of view <clears throat> comes from all the programming we receive during domestication. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a different way of looking at that word domestication um, in a little bit. So I want to tell a little story. Um, and I want you to imagine yourselves in this situation. All right, so uh, I was on, I had to fly a lot for a period of time for my job. I had tons of flights. And you know, there's hardly any direct flights anymore. So I had a lot of time in airplanes. Lots of times, most of the time, the flights were full or close to it. So you always had somebody sitting next to you. But I happened to be on a flight where it wasn't that full. And I happened to get a seat where there was no one in the middle, which is kind of a luxury flying, right? And I um, didn't expect to have anybody sitting next to me. Uh, but some woman who um, something was wrong with her seat. I don't know if it was, I don't know what happened, but she had to change seats. 
Now, I'm going to pause for a minute and ask you to visualize woman. I said woman. I bet you every single one of you has a different picture in your mind of that woman. Right? If I say young woman, okay, that narrows it down a little bit, but you're still all going to have a different picture. Right? And our reality is an outpicturing of our individual thoughts. Right? So <clears throat> she came up to me. She was looking for another seat to sit in. And she came up to me and she said, uh, do you mind if I sit in that seat? <clears throat> I said, I'd rather you wouldn't. She was so mad. Now, think of yourself in that situation. Somebody says no to you, right? What are you going to, how are you going to react? Are you going to think, oh, okay, well, she just doesn't want me to sit there. It's no, no big deal. Are you going to be mad, think that person is rude? Well, she certainly did. <laughs> she was so mad. She sat in, and, and by the way, there were plenty of seats. It wasn't like my seat was the only seat. But she sure as heck didn't expect me to say no. In fact, I didn't say no. I just said my truth. I prefer that you wouldn't. And so she, there was a seat in the middle in front of, a row in front of me, my row. She sat in that seat, but she couldn't let it go. She turned around. She gave me the evil eye. She talked to people about me. Even when we got off the plane and went to baggage claim, she, I could tell because she was like looking at me and then talking to her, poor was there. And my brother picked me up from the airport. My brother was an amazing spiritual compadre for me. And I told him the story and he said, take nothing personally. And because I actually had a little trouble letting go of that interaction. Because somebody's treating me kind of badly, in my opinion. But it wasn't about me, was it? Right? It wasn't about me. OK, so imagine how you would feel in either one of those roles in that scenario, and how you might feel in either one of those rows. And remember that it was about you. <clears throat> so this is another book called The Eye of the Storm. And <clears throat> this is a book that we use in a class. And we haven't done this class in a very long time. The class is called <clears throat> The Art of No One and Nothing Against Me. And um, this is the book that we use. And The Eye of the Storm is not E-Y-E. -E, it's I, me. And I want to do a reading. I have to see which one I was going to do. This chapter is titled, See It Right, Not Make It Right. <clears throat> the second attribute of wholeness is principle. It is the I, me, in the storm of misperception. Because everything you see or notice about yourself and your situation is viewed through the lens of self-worth. Your seeing is incomplete. By definition, the perception of an adversary is evidence of misperception. Why? Because no one is against you. So <clears throat> I've said this before, but Jay Smith, who is a reverend over at Home Center, said something that I will never, ever forget. And that is, these people love you so much that they give you an opportunity to dig into yourself, I'm paraphrasing, to <laughs> dig into yourself and get to what is the lesson I need to learn here. And that's also about me. So I want to tell a story, another story out of my life, which was from my, um, not my marriage to my wonderful, fabulous husband, Mark, my previous marriage. And I hired a caterer named W.C. Freddy, and he was quite the character, as you might imagine from his name. Um, and 
So I put my trust in him. I, we had an ice sculpture that we ordered and uh, sort of Cajun food that I had a vision of how it was all going to be presented and, and stuff. So <clears throat> when we got to the venue, the ice sculpture was melting. You couldn't even tell what it was anymore. Because he didn't bother to find out whether the venue had a freezer that he could keep it in so it wouldn't melt. And it was in the early part of October in Southern California, so it's, it was warm. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. And then the food. Oh my gosh. It's not that it tasted bad, it tasted fine, but it was presented terribly. Nothing like my vision. Nothing like my vision. Just big silver bowls of stuff. Um, and I was mad at him for years. I felt like he ruined my wedding. I judged him at badly. Even after he died, I was still mad at him. Um, even after that husband left, I was still mad at that caterer. Not kidding. So I was doing some forgiveness work in the spiritual center I went to in California. And I had this awareness come up. And it was, I was like, whoa, it really knocked my socks off. Um, the anger that I felt wasn't about him at all. It was because I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed of what I had presented to my guests. And I had to work through that shame um, before I could let go of my anger and judgment toward W.C. Freddie. And one, one thing I did was I called my best friend who was at the wedding, and I told her that I felt ashamed. And she said, you know, I remember the wedding, but I don't remember the food. <laughs> so that was the beginning of me working through that shame that came up in my forgiveness work. It was about me. <clears throat> so, you know, I could have held on to that anger till <laughs> my dying day if I hadn't done that work. <clears throat> There's a quote from Marianne Williamson. Love brings everything unlike itself up to be healed. Right, when I first heard that quote, I, I really couldn't make heads or tails of it. I had no idea what that really meant. And this is kind of comes back to what Jay Smith said. It's like every single interaction we have that is upsetting, every single situation that we're in that is upsetting, every single thing we view out in the world that is upsetting is about me and my movie. Because my reality is an outpicturing of my thoughts, as I said that earlier. So uh, after thinking about this um, saying, this principle that she communicates, I'm not sure what book it's uh, from, but I'm pretty sure it's from one of her books, um, I realized that love is a driving force in the universe, right? God and love are the same thing. So love works on our behalf. Love is always to support us, right? So when we are upset by any situation, it's an opportunity to do the work inside. If it brings up fear, anger, resentment, judgment, any of that uncomfortable stuff that we don't really like to feel or look at, it's an opportunity to look inside and see what's triggered. What is this fear about? Do I think my survival is threatened? A lot of us do. We get in a situation and we get scared. And I'm not talking about like jumping off a cliff or something. I'm talking about interactions with other people or situations in the world, right? What's going on inside of us is what we need to look at. The focus has to come back 
to me and dig deep to figure out what is being triggered in me, childhood trauma, religious trauma, um, physical events that have happened, but it's still about me, right? <clears throat> okay, so I have another reading from Eye of the Storm. And this is a little bit about a little bit about that concept uh, that um, Ruiz talks about. Uh, um, no, now I can't forget. I forget the word. Um, but this is a little bit about how we get this way. Um, <clears throat> the sense of separation. Unless your parents were Mary and Joseph, you were probably never told that you were a child of God. You were unable to know your true self as whole and perfect. You were born into a world system that was unable to mirror your innate worth to a degree which, you, which would allow you to emerge into adulthood with your own sense of wholeness intact. Anybody relate to that? Raise your hand. Anybody relate to that? Right. Your caregivers were not always able to be totally present, fully alive to you. And I'll add reliable um, and other things that children need. The sense of separation you feel within yourself, between others, and life generally is an effect of being born into an imperfect caregiving environment. Rebirth into this world subjected you to events and circumstances that caused you to separate yourself from your essential wholeness. In order to manage a separate existence, you have learned how to control others, avoid conflict, resist change, and be right. By being right, you circumvented the pain of your past. Right? And you know, there's that famous saying, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? <clears throat> so, uh, my last story, some of you have heard some of this before. Um, so I, I was working at a new job, and the first day that I, that I went to this new job, office environment, um, I went out to lunch, and I found a, a pamphlet, or kind of a little um, multi-page you know, brochure or something, that was about it, uh, the spiritual uh, activities and organizations and all that that's you know, new age metaphysical, um, and I can't remember what the title of it was, but it was obvious from the cover what it was about. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm interested in that. So I brought it back to the office, I put it on my desk, and one of my coworkers who um, I had struggles with the, the entire time he was there um, said to me, <clears throat> oh, are you one of those tinfoil hat people? And inside, I, I mean, I didn't know how to react. Uh, this was a coworker on the first day saying something like that to me, and I did not feel comfortable. I did not feel comfortable. <clears throat> so I went home, because I was flying in between for a little while, and I went home and <clears throat> I made a tinfoil hat. <laughs> and I brought it back with me, and I wore it the day that I was back to work. And he thought that was hilarious. Um, and it could have stopped there. But I was still really uncomfortable inside. And the conflict with this guy just escalated. We were at odds with each other the, the, for months and months and months. And he became the manager the, of the team. And that made it even worse. And I didn't like him. We had, we butted heads. Uh, management got involved because of our conflict. And I just simply didn't know how to handle it. So I could easily say it was about him. Almost everyone on the team didn't like him. And there was only one person on the team that was really friends with him. So, you know, that's evidence that I could gather to say, this is about him, okay? Nobody likes him, he's inappropriate, he's hard to deal with, and I, 
I could easily gather that evidence from you know everybody else and say, okay, I'm right. It's not you know not my fault. It's not about me. That's not the truth. So that one was so uncomfortable for me that I wanted to run away. I wanted to quit the job. <laughs> it was that bad. I wanted to quit the job, and um, go find another job where I wasn't going to encounter somebody like that. You know, but God loves me. Sometimes I wish God didn't love me so much, because then I just keep getting these lessons. And, you know, I knew that running away was me putting the focus outside myself to the situation. And even though it was terribly uncomfortable for quite a while, I was working with a Reverend Patricia Roller at the time, and we dug in to what was going on with me. And I worked so hard on myself to get to a place where no matter what he did or said, I didn't react. I had peace of mind. And believe me, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done because there were triggers after triggers after triggers after triggers. And it would have been so easy, like I said, to just make it about him. But I remember Jay saying, they love you so much. He loved me on a spirit level. He loved me so much. He would continue to give me these opportunities to learn about myself and to grow, right? And that's what happened. Toward the end of his time there, I could deal with the interactions. He didn't change. He didn't change. But I did. So <clears throat> everything that happens is an opportunity. <clears throat> OK. So I hope that um, you were able to put yourself in these situations and think about how you, know, you might react and what it would take for you to do the deep digging to discover what is being triggered in you and take the opportunity to work through those feelings and not just the feelings, because feelings come and go. Right, you can just feel anger and it will subside. Although, with the case of W. C. Freddie, it didn't. But um, <laughs> most of the time, actually, what what the anger subsided? Of course, it did, because feelings come and go. But the judgment that I held toward him didn't go away until I did the work on myself. Right, and so every single conflict you have or situation that troubles you is an opportunity to dig deep. And I've told you this before, and some of you have heard it, but um, there was a period of time in the recent past when all of the things that are happening in the world, and things that are happening in the world haven't really changed that much, right? It's still very troubled. There's still something, if you want to focus on it, every day you can get upset about. And I was meeting with my rabbi, and I was crying. None of it, none of it really affects me personally. It's, it's not like, you know, um, my life is any different. And it wasn't going to be. <clears throat> but I was so sad for some people that were had you know being treated so unfairly and i was so upset about you know the um other tragedies that are affecting people and all all this on the world stage and i'm i'm crying and crying for the other people who are suffering and he said you know if that out there which is not my movie Right? It's not. My life isn't really terribly impacted by all that. It's not my movie. He said, if, <clears throat> if all of that out there is affecting you so much, then perhaps, he didn't actually say perhaps. He was more direct than that. He said, then your spiritual life needs work. 
Right. So I spent a couple of years working on detaching, but not just detaching like, oh, I don't care. That's not what detachment is. Right? Detachment is, you know, you ob observe what's happening um, and not ha having it affect you so tragically. And I spent a couple of years bringing spirit, my knowingness of who I truly am, what I came here to be, um, and learning to detach from those things with spirit as my comfort and um, my right arm and my guide, right? So it's not just that we need to do the work, internal work of finding out what's being triggered. The next step is to know, learn and know, and really truly get it that we are spirit embodied. Right? We are spirit embodied. <clears throat> and we're having these experiences so we can learn, learn that. Yeah? Okay, time for a little meditation. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't warn you very, very well, did I, Christine? <laughs> Christine's going to play a little music. Um, <clears throat> and what I want you to do is close your eyes if you, if you feel you, you can, and get comfy in your chair. Notice where there's any tension and let go, relax, listen. And imagine that whenever you feel tempted to defend yourself or judge another, Lay aside any self-concepts that portray you as weak, unworthy, unlovable, unsafe, and let the awareness of your true self arise in you. <clears throat> so right now in this room, let your awareness of your true self arise in you. Remember, while you do that, spirit remains in and through you, giving you strength, making defending yourself unnecessary. <clears throat> Sit quietly in the stillness and wait for God. Let spirit's voice within lift your judgment of others and yourself. Let yourself see the oneness of all that is and know that separation is an illusion, that we are one, I am you, you are me, each and every one of us. <clears throat> so let's just sit in the silence, letting those ideas percolate letting spirit in and your connectedness to spirit and each other. Just sit, in, sit in the silence for a little while and let those ideas come to fruition. And when you're ready, come back into your body. Come back into the room. Feel the chair underneath you and the floor underneath you. 
You can open your eyes. <clears throat> I want to finish this talk with Mother Teresa. And I saw this in my dentist office, of all places. She's an amazing dentist. Um, so I thought this was appropriate, and I thought you might like to hear it. I'm sure some of you have heard it before. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. <laughs>